Hello, my name is Matt Whitman. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And I, I think I have a problem. And my problem is, guys really like going to churches maybe too much. Maybe it's getting to the point that it's weird, but it's not just the buildings, it's not just the people, it's not just the faith and the theology. It's that every one of these places tells a story. And it's a story that is similar to the, the journey that I'm on. It's the journey of faith and trying to figure out the big questions of life and death and existence and meaning and God and the Bible. And every one of these churches, in a way, is in conversation with all the other churches you see and all the other Christians and all the not Christians from the history of humanity. And I just can't help myself. So now when we go on family vacations, I bring along this little get, uh, kit that is of uh, my camera and this tiny little rig that I take with me, you know, just in case we go to a cool church and somebody there is like, oh, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to turn on the camera, I could show you around. I'm like, whoa, oh, really? I mean, I just have it right here. Could we do that? So that's what happened when we went to Savannah, Georgia here a couple months ago. We were walking around this beautiful, very old by American standards town on the Atlantic coast in Georgia. That's the American South. And this is a, it's a colonial town. It was designed to be a, a model of how city planning could be by a governor named, I think it was James Oglethorpe. And John and Charles Wesley were a part of Oglethorpe's Savannah. Now those names, John and Charles Wesley are pretty big in the history of Christianity, of Protestantism specifically. Those are two names that are associated with the, the founding of the Methodist Church. And that's a group that from the 1700s on occupies a pretty significant branch of the family tree of Christianity, including the outgrowths that have come off of that. It's a pretty diverse group. There are different brands of Methodism, and I have not visited, at least with a camera, a Methodist church yet. So when I saw this one and saw that it was called the Wesley Monumental Church on this beautiful, quaint, old square in Savannah, Georgia, I couldn't help. And I went and asked, and they were like, you know what? Yeah, let's just do it. And so I met a gentleman named Reverend Ben Martin, who's fantastic. And he explained to me in the course of this conversation a little bit about the history of John and Charles Wesley, a little bit about the history of this local church, a little bit about Methodism in general, and a little bit about the United Methodist Church. So there's a ton to learn here with a great dude in a beautiful church dedicated to a really important part of the whole history of Christianity. I grabbed my little mobile rig. I even slapped a reverse facing camera on there. It looks a little weird, but you'll get a better sense of the two of us talking if I include that footage of me. So we'll leave it in there anyway. I think we're going to have a blast. Let's head to Savannah, Georgia and meet Reverend Ben Martin. Oh, this is beautiful. Congregation formed um, 1868, started building this sanctuary um, in 1875, hopefully as a monument to the Wesleyan movement, to the Wesley brothers. So you see the John and Charles Wesley in the windows. Oh, yeah, the, there we the go. Wesley windows are kind of one of the featured things in the sanctuary. But so Methodists kind of from all over the world donated money to help build it. Um, took about 15 years, finished in 1890, had a big yellow fever epidemic in the middle of it. And of course, okay. post-Civil War reconstruction. And and uh, pretty, pretty amazing that they built this thing in that, under those circumstances. Yeah. This is a United Methodist Church. Yes, United Methodist. Is that the first version of Methodist? No, really. The United Methodist, uh, 1968, the United Methodist formed it, combined Evangelical Brethren um, Church. Before that, it was the Methodist Church. Just uh, Methodist. The Methodist Church, right. Before that, it was Methodist Church, Episcopal, North and South. Because it was part of the Anglican or North American Anglican tradition? Yeah, it was born out of the Anglican tradition. Wesley, okay. of course, was an Anglican priest okay. um, or, or Church of England and never really left that and remained an Anglican priest until he died. Um, what formed the denomination um, was the need for our sacrament in America. Basically, it was a missional outreach in America. And as it grew, you know, just kind of took off and grew, they had a need for sacrament. Um, baptism, communion. So Wesley ordained, reluctantly ordained a couple of folks who, you know, whether or not that was his yeah, authority to do so, he, he did. And so at that point, it sort of um, started forming as a denomination in America. I think everybody's heard the story about the Wesley brothers sailing to Savannah. Mm -hmm. They're on the boat with the Moravians. Right. The storm kicks in. I don't think the Wesley brothers spoke German. And I don't think the Moravians spoke English, it would be my guess, but he saw the Moravians just relaxed, prayerful, singing while everybody else is freaking out. Yeah. And that made some kind of impression on him. Right. 
and then they both come here. Charles is pretty quick in and out, is my understanding. But John's here for a few years. Yeah, a couple of years. And then he leaves feeling like it didn't go well, and that's when yeah. kind of his theological maturation that leads to Methodism happens. So I guess my question is, what happened here in Savannah, and did it go well? No, no, it did not go well, really, in terms of, in his mind, he came here to be a missionary to the Native Americans in this area. Um, he came here with Oglethorpe, serving as the basically the priest for the community, and Charles's brother was the secretary for Oglethorpe. Um, and so coming here, never was much outreach or success among the Native Americans. Um, and he, he was, um, you know, just a pretty, a pretty hard guy, I think, to, to get along with. He was not, not a, a pretty serious guy all the time. Anyway, you mean John he, was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, actually, um, there was a woman, Sophie Hopkins, who uh, had, had some desire to her relationship with John, thought they might marry. John decided against marriage. She ends up marrying somebody else. Um, he felt, I think, spurned, <laughs> spurned by that whole thing, refused to serve them communion. Um, Why? Which, um, That's a huge deal in English. Yeah, basically painted a picture of them as having you know, done something wrong. That they oh, I didn't even think about it that way. Yeah. And, and oh, so, so scandalous, too. Uh, yeah. So it created quite a scandal, and he was, he basically <laughs> left under the dark at night before it was over. I went up to South Carolina, caught a, a ship and sailed home. Went out of Charleston? Uh, with his tail between his legs. But, wow. But uh, so it, well, it did. On what grounds did he deny them communion? Like just hurt feelings? Can you deny communion for so. hurt feelings? I guess so. So it really didn't go well. I mean, it was... He, 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 it did not in terms of his work here. Um, and on the way back, of course, he sought out the Moravians when he got back. That eventually has this, what he called his heartwarming experience. He did a Bible study on Aldersgate Street. When okay. he said, I came to um, believe that my sins were forgiven, even mine. He said, um, not just that Christ died for the world, but he died for, he, for me. And it became a very personal faith for him. It's really when he, when he began to understand what grace is. And, and then really the whole Wesleyan theology is built around a theology of grace. And, and that, at that moment when he began, it wasn't about his, you know, how much he prayed, how much he was in the word, how, how many people he visited in prison who were sick. It wasn't about all the things that he had done to practice his religion um, over the years that, that he was saved by grace. How does that theme, that theological point of emphasis, still manifest in Methodism today? I, we, st we still, I would say, our, our theology, for me, and we talk about this all the time, is a theology of grace. Is that in the sense that God loves us for who we are, not what we do or what we don't do. Um, I mean, part of the reason in a tradition like ours is a, a tradition that practices infant baptism. Um, is It's a symbol of prevenient grace, that God loves and claims that child, places a claim on that child long before that child ever knows it. Um, and that, and yet, th that's not all that has to happen. You know, that we're saved by grace through faith, but through faith, faith, the child still has to come to faith. Um, and, and which he would call that a moment of justifying grace, the moment when you come to realize for yourself, this is where Christ died for me, um, for my life. That would, would what he called a moment of justification. But then that only launched you into a lifelong process of what he calls sanctifying grace, or growing in the love of Christ, really growing more and more like Christ. Um, ultimately moving towards the, the ultimate goal we call perfection, Christian perfection, which was probably one of the few doctrines that was somewhat unique to the Methodist movement or to the Wesleyan movement in Methodism was, was Christian perfection, even though it wasn't unique to Wesley. He had borrowed that, learned that from somebody else. Um, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect, Jesus okay. would say. Um, but for him, perfection was growing to the point that Everything you did is motivated by love. It was really perfection and love. When I think of Methodism, then, I think of something that has two to three road markers along the journey of, of a walk of faith, whereas a more Baptistic tradition would point to one moment. It's yes. Salvation occurs, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then growth occurs through that process. Sanctification ultimately happens on the other side. Yes. I, I sense that Methodism is a little bit of a different deal. For some, there are two points along the way, and for maybe some others in the more Wesleyan Methodist holiness expression, there's maybe three. At least. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, what, what I talk to people, we have, Methodism is sort of a, 
big tent theologically. And so we attract the people from a lot of different traditions. You know, constantly have people join the church that grew up Roman Catholic or they grew up Southern Baptist or they grew up in a lot of, you know, Pentecostal, grew up in a lot of different traditions yeah. and end up here and find a place that they feel like there's room for them. Um, but a lot of what I talk to them about is the difference in process oriented salvation and event based salvation. Okay. Um, and, and a good Southern Baptist tradition, for instance, I, I would call event based salvation. That is, you, you need to know the day, the time, the moment when you accepted Christ, were baptized. That was your mo It was an event, a moment in time. You okay. were saved at a moment in time. Wesley, on the other hand, would talk about salvation being this process. It started long before you ever knew it. God loved you before you ever knew it, and it was in the love of God that was drawing you, drawing you to a place, a moment of, of awakening or acknowledgement or acceptance of what Christ did for me. That would be another one of those moments in the process. That sounds a little bit reformed, yeah, like the element yeah. of God acting first, at least. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and then moving you, you know, into a, a sort of a journey of uh, into sanctification or a journey. The, so salvation is a journey that begins before you ever know it. God places a claim on on your life, um, but doesn't end really until heaven. He would call that glorifying grace when we finally um, are in heaven and only could reach that really when we're stripped of, of the flesh. Hmm. Um, because otherwise, as long as we're here, we're still gonna struggle with issues of the flesh and, and dealing with sin. You know, Methodism was grant, built around small groups. He really had no intention of starting a church. He was content to be an Anglican. Yeah, he was, he was really trying to reform his own Anglican church, but his starting with small groups um, class meeting. He started what was called the class meeting and he gathered people okay. basically just he called to watch over each other's souls. And they met every week. It was an accountability group basically. Okay. They met to talk about how do you how are you struggling with sin? What did you struggle with? And there was a series of questions they went through every week to talk about how do you overcome really how do you overcome sin? Um, okay. and that process of discipleship, it was a it was a process of discipleship much um, while we we're called Methodist, there was a method to your discipleship. What was going wrong in 18th century English Christianity that caused Wesley to feel like some sort of innovation was needed? What was it a reaction to? One piece of it was sort of the inward turn, um, the elitism of the, of the Anglican church. Um, part of, he got drawn out, Whitfield, uh, George Whitfield was one of the, you know, a big influence for Wesley who started field preaching, um, leaving the church, going uh, particularly among the coal miners, um, in England that sort of were kind of the kind of folks that wouldn't be welcome in the Anglican church. At Anglicanism time. had become that fancy. Because it had, I guess, become somewhat elitist. Um, and you, mm. you, know, they, you dare not preach outside the pulpit. Any preaching outside the pulpit would be sort of oh, interesting, heretical, if you would. So do and you feel like that's still in the DNA of Methodism? Now, earlier you were talking about the big tent nature. And, and probably, I mean... We are men of action. We see the, the playing field and what the world is. Probably the biggest critique you would get from more conservative Protestants outside of Methodism at this point would be that oh, it's a pretty big tent. Like well, maybe there's some stuff that would be worth pushing back on culturally. Right, right. Whereas typically what I hear from my Methodist friends is like, that's not really a bug, it's a feature to us. Is, is that born all the way back out of that 18th century elitism and small tentism that Wesley observed? I think certainly the, the evangelical nature of the Methodist movement um, is born out of, out of that experience. Wesley going you know, to, to the poor, the dispossessed, um, the, the left out, um, he would see as following the model that Jesus followed, um, yeah. going to those that other people said don't belong um, and offering them Christ, offering them a, a, a offering them hope, offering them grace. Um, and so, yeah, I think that you could say that spills over into our, you know, into who we are now. And even being a church that with a theology of grace, uh, of course, there's certainly people who say you can take grace <laughs> to an extent that wasn't intended to be taken to the point that one of the old uh, criticisms of Methodists was basically Methodists don't know what they believe um, because Wesley wasn't a systematic theologian. He wrote extensively, but he wasn't writing systematic theology. And so we were not a confessing church in the sense that if you join a Methodist church, you don't have to sign a doctrinal statement. You, There's no Heidelberg or Westminster for right. Methodists. Right. Now we say the Apostles' Creed in, in worship every week um, because we would say that's sort of an example of orthodoxy. And 
one of the reasons Meth people would say, well, Methodists don't know what they believe is because Methodists are basically just basic Orthodox Protestants um, who, who believe that, for me, I would say who believe Orthodoxy centers around who is God, who is Christ, how, who are, how do we relate, what has Christ done for us, and how do we relate to Christ? So it's more around those basic beliefs. And in that regard, you're just historically creedal, the big yes. creeds, yes. It's on which means that you're talking about definitionally the exact same specifically named and characterized deity that anyone who can say the creeds named. So the Orthodox, the Catholics, the Baptists, yeah. the Pentecostals, the Reformed types. Yeah, one of the little cliches I, that came out of Methodism, out of the Methodist movement was, um, and this, I don't know that Wesley literally said this, but it sort of was a sum up some of his, his positions was, in essentials, we should have unity. We should we should all be able to agree there are some essentials to what he's talking about is essentials to salvation and essentials to salvation we should have unity that believers across all denominations should be able to say there are some things we can agree on yeah apostle creed kind of things um in non-essentials he we should have liberty we should think and let think now the argument's over what's essential and what's non-essential um, sure. and, and but then the last piece of it was in all things we should have charity yeah we should be able to love each other yeah strongly um, agree and, and I think that's why we have been sort of a big tent theologically, as we tried to say, in essentials, we should have unity. I'm not one of these types who by any means believes that we should create some new institution and all the churches should be forced or cajoled into coming under this institution and all be in charge. You know, somebody has to do it. No, I mean, while acknowledging that I think it makes sense that there are a lot of different expressions of Christianity, and I mm -hmm. think there's benefit to all of those different expressions yes. of creedal, historical, orthodox Christianity. I'm still really intrigued by the idea of what it would look like to put it back together in terms of a convictional unity mm. where we know what each other think about things. I mean, that's kind of what this conversation's about in a way. Right. What's the Methodist read on that? Is there an impulse and energy toward that church unity thing? Wesley was very ecumenical in the sense that he, he worked with people that were not just you know, Anglican and the Methodism, I think, followed that trend. Um, because it goes back to that idea. If we can decide on what are essentials, um, then can't we just agree to think and let think in non-essentials? Can, can we agree to disagree on some non-essential things and realize that those are not essential to salvation? Um, now, the, the question still remains for a yeah. lot of folks, what is the essential, what's an essential and what's not? Well, and that gets tricky because my, the question I was formulating in my brain was gonna be, so are there any essentials outside of the creeds? But the creeds don't really speak to salvation. So what would be the Methodist view on what the essentials of salvation are? I think certainly the essentials would be faith in Christ. Um, we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, and that, that would be sort of an essential that we come to understand that what, acknowledging what Christ did for us on the cross, the atoning death of Christ on the cross. Um, now, there are certainly people that have different interpretations on atonement theory and all that. And we, sure. we probably even have a wide view of atonement theory, what happened on the cross. Um, you know, as, as opposed to it wouldn't all be like I think the moral influence theory probably carried a lot of weight through in Methodism and the Wesleyan really? movement. Okay. Um, you know, that influence of what Christ did wins our hearts. Um, a love so great that he would die for us should win our hearts as opposed to just solely a focused on some kind of transactional atonement that Christ's death paid the debt for my sin. But we certainly would, we would say it's both and. Uh, I've got a ton of Catholic friends and have really enjoyed learning so much more in this mm -hmm. season of my life about Catholicism mm -hmm. from my Catholic friends. But in learning about that, I really am sensing that I have a difference of understanding in some aspects of the theology of salvation. I guess soteriology is the fancy yeah, word for yeah, that yeah. than my Catholic friends. What you're saying, th that sounds more in the zip code of what you consider to be center cut historical Protestant orthodoxy. Yeah. And, and I the think salvation that's... by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I mean, that's kind of a Reformation language at that point. Mm -hmm. it, it, because it, we were basic orthodox Protest, Protestant. Christianity um, is who we are. Um, now, I think the process of salvation still comes into play, this whole idea of sanctification. What is essential to salvation? Yeah. Um, the continuing process. Yeah. You know, that it's not just 
I profess faith in Christ and I'm baptized and I'm done. I don't ever have to do anything else. Or, or, you know, that Arminian position that you can fall away from grace. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Boy, that's got to change the equation a ton, though, in terms of the lived experience of what it is to be a Protestant Christian in a tradition where that's not an option versus the lived experience of what it is to be a Protestant Christian where you know, the understanding is that you could fall away. How does that manifest in terms of what it is to be a Methodist Christian? I think the emphasis on discipleship, the, the emphasis on sort of lifetime growth, you know, that, that okay. you stay in the process, you're continually seeking to grow in grace. Um, you need to you need to practice your spiritual disciplines. You, you need to be in the Word. You need to pray. You need to worship. You need to serve. You need fellowship and fasting and solitude and silence and all of those disciplines that we try to continue to teach people to keep growing, to, to stay on the to stay on the path, um, and and to finish the race. You know that that um, and that explains why when the reformers in Geneva or under Knox in Scotland or even some of the, the English reformers in the last part of the 16th century, when they got together in homes to look at the text, to think about things, they went right to big picture theology, theology proper, who is God, what does the text teach about, this point of disagreement or that point of disagreement. But by the time we get to the mid 18th century and, and Wesley's personal revival and, and larger revival that he and his colleagues like Whitfield were a part of, the concern is more let's get together in this house and think about theology as it applies to what the heck are we doing here? Yeah. Is is my life honoring to God? Is there is there evidence? Is there fruit in what yes. I'm doing yes. that would be indicative of my continued? Uh, this is foreign language to me, so I'm doing my best. Yeah. My continued um, presence in the kingdom. My continued being in. I, I don't know. How do you guys say it? Well, I just just grow, growing in grace, and are you ever? That sounded so much you, better where, than mine. Are you that ever out? To, you know, I don't know. Just say you're ever out, but um, you just you, you can certainly wander off. Hmm. You know, it, it, we would say you can you can't get lost along the way, um, and I think yeah, that that, imp, that probably is the emphasis for us is on on the you know staying on the journey. This is a lifelong process. Discipleship is critical. Now, I don't think of Methodism as being like a, a nitpicky, I don't think of it as being on the more legalistic end of the spectrum. No, definitely not. I think of it as being on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. I think detractors would accuse it of being too far on the other end of the mm -hmm. spectrum. I'm not saying I agree with that. Sure, certainly, certainly. The, so with that theology, though, it seems like it would lend itself to like really getting after people like, hey, I heard what you said when you stubbed your toe. Hey, I saw what you did on Sunday. Well, you're mowing the lawn. Like you're breaking some rules. It seems like it would lend itself to getting really in people's business. How have you kept it from becoming that? Well, it's certainly that that's a big part. That's a part of the history. <laughs> oh, okay. Know? You can look back at the uh, you know, annually have what's called a charge conference. Um, is in our annual um, meeting we where where we sit down and look at the year. The district superintendent comes and that kind of thing. They have charge conference records, for instance, where they were showing so-and-so had to be removed from the church because he was caught drinking on Saturday night too much. Down oh, down mercy. Down. Oh, okay. So there, there, certainly we did have a history. A lot of people be out of church. Yeah, because the holiness movement, you know, the holiness movement that had strong ties to, to Wesleyan movement as well. Um, that holiness movement really was, you know, hard on works, hmm. you know, you know, work, sort of works-based. And um, so... I would say that United Methodism, um, theologically, some people would say had wandered from sort of that hard Wesleyan holiness emphasis. Okay. That that we softened that Wesleyan holiness emphasis very, you know, very much, and put the emphasis back on, um, and I, I think sort of back backing up to what. Albert Outler was a teacher, a Methodist teacher out at SMU, a Wesleyan theologian. Okay. Um, and he sort of coined the phrase the Wesleyan quadrilateral, um, which he was basically saying, if you want to do theology, if you want to discern um, where God is at, is at work in something, you look at four things. First, it's grounded in Scripture. Scripture is always fundamental in the place you started. And this was based on how he thought Wesley did theology. Um, you started with Scripture. What does Scripture say about it? Um, but secondly... You also had to look at tradition. The church has been interpreting this scripture and interpreting this theology for 
a long, long time. What, what is the tradition of the church set about it? Um, the third, though, would be reason. Um, Wesley thought we were given a mind to, to use, and to, he said, yeah. I'm a man of one book, but he was highly educated and, and widely read. Okay. Um, and so he said, reason, you have to use your mind um, to think, does this make sense? And even when you're interpreting scripture, you're looking at tradition. What is tradition said about this? You're using reason. Mm -hmm. what is re how does reason speak into interpreting the scripture? Um, and then finally, um, the thing that sort of, I think got heavy into emph emph emphasis in Methodism was personal experience. Okay. What does my experience tell me? Um, does this resonate with my experience or not? Or experience would confirm um, you know, what scripture said and tradition tells me and reason speaks into, um, but does my, does my experience or at least someone whose experience I, I, you know, I can look at and uh, does it confirm that for me? Is that a pecking order, one, two, three, four, or is that quadrilateral? Lateral scripture always weighs heavier things. than it. It always starts with scripture. And Everything. so experience ranks fourth? Yeah, and it's, experience would be what confirms the rest. Oh, you know, sort okay. Of scripture, so the, scripture the idea that if you are indwelt by like, God's spirit, like a member of the Trinity, theoretically is present with Christians, yeah. there should be something that happens in your life that aligns with the teachings of the text and... Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, um, Wesley's okay. warmed heart experience. Oh yeah, uh, sure. Which was a really a spiritual, you know, Pentecostals would say that he was baptized in the spirit that all day. Right. He was all right. or filled with the spirit. Um, is it all right if we walk up here? Sure. Am I allowed to walk yeah, on the absolutely. stage area? Absolutely. I'd just like to take a look as I, as I hit you with this question about Wesley one more time. What would you summarize a church that has Wesley and monument in the name as being a monument to? What aspect of who Wesley was and what he was about and what he represents do you want your congregation and your church to be a monument to? I think it um, would want to be a monument to the Wesleyan theology of grace. Uh, you know, that, that's, I think that's who we are, that we're, that we're a grace-filled church that embodies the love of Christ um, for all people, for, for everybody who walks in the door and uh, can find a place where they're loved and accepted, but also at the same place, um, never abandoning the, the, our idea that Christ, that Christ, that Jesus is the revelation of God, is the prime revelation of God. If I want to know what God is like, that, that we talk about Jesus. So we, we talk about Jesus a lot here um, because he, he, when we've seen him, we've seen the Father the way we look at it. And, and I think that um, Wesley was certainly Christ-centered uh, and, and believed that people needed a relationship with God and Christ, that, that they could come to the Father in a way through Christ you can in any other way. Um, and so if we can embody the love of Christ and bring people into a relationship with God through Christ, in Christ, um, that, that, that's who we'd want to be and what we want to emphasize here.